eh, bueno, primero me voy a presentar yo, que no me conoceréis. Soy Leticia Lara, soy la bloguera que está detrás de Fantástica Ficción y tampoco se me va a notar mucho que soy súper fan de Ken. Así que si me veis muy emocionada en algún momento, pues me, me tomaré una tirica o algo. Y también tenemos aquí a Ernest. ¿Qué tal, Ernest? Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Ernest. Eh, a los trabajo en el periódico de Cataluña eh, en diversas tareas. Actualmente llevo la sección de opinión, pero eso es el, eh, la obligación. Y después viene la devoción, que entre, que entre otras es escribir siempre que puedo sobre género fantástico, ciencia ficción y otras cuestiones eh, de más. Ah, ah, yo también estoy muy contento de poder hablar con, con Ken Liu cuando publicó el primer volumen de la trilogía La Gracia de los Reyes pude hacerle una, llamemos una entrevista por correo electrónico. Eh, ahora damos un pasito más y esperemos que en algún momento también podamos hacer algo equivalente con visita en, en, en España. De momento, esta vez no ha podido ser. Eh, nos hemos presentado nosotros. Uh, si alguien está viendo esta entrevista es que sabe quién es eh, que Liu, por lo tanto lo que de, digamos es bastante innecesario, pero sería bastante descortés no presentarlo, con lo cual eh, eh, os eh, recordaré que, que Ken eh, ha publicado ya en España, tengo aquí dispuesto toda la bibliografía, dos antologías de, de relatos cortos de su autoría, el todo el papel y la chica oculta, eh, dos antologías de ciencia ficción china que ha editado y los tenemos, las tres visibles y estrellas rotas, y ahora me tendré que esforzar un poco más para coger los tres volúmenes publicados ya en España de la que empezaron con la gracia de los reyes y eran con el muro de las tormentas y ahora estamos con el Trono velado, una serie de fantasía épica en una ambientación muy particular y de la que esperemos que nos que podamos hablar algún rato. Eh, ¿Empiezas tú, Leticia? Sí, claro. Eh, qué buen libro. Como sabéis, pues eh, que en algunas veces se parece que es capaz de duplicarse en el tiempo y en el espacio porque a, a su labor como escritor añade la de traductor y su trabajo normal y guionista es realmente espectacular. Pero bueno, podemos empezar a centrarnos un poquito en la publicación que nos ha traído aquí. Porque sabemos que cuando en, ideaste la saga, eh, eh, la saga de la que estamos hablando, tu intención era hacer la trilogía. Pero, sin embargo, te viste en la tesitura de tener que dividir la última novela en dos para convertirla en una tetralogía, por su longitud o por las razones que nos quieras explicar ahora. ¿Escogiste un momento determinado para hacer el corte entre novelas, por ejemplo, en, en un cliffhanger, ¿O fue directamente, bueno, pues esta es más o menos la mitad, por aquí cortamos? Um, thank you. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for coming here to celebrate um, the publication of The Veiled Throne with me. Um, so I'll start by just telling everyone a little bit about the history of this last book. Um, so it took me a whole decade to write the entire series from start to finish. Um, and Leticia actually is one of my beta readers along the way. So she got to see the very end of it before anyone else. <laughs> um, and um, when I was writing the very last book, um, I kept on writing and writing and I realized the story was bigger than I had at first uh, conceived of it. Um, and uh, somewhere along the way, actually, some characters showed up who insisted on becoming part of the story that I hadn't planned for. Um, and they sort of inserted themselves into the plot. And you will get to meet them in this particular book. Um, so let me just to give you a sense of what happened here. Um, this is the English version of The Veiled Throne and Speaking Bones, the very last two books. Um, and... When I finished writing the book, the book at the time, and I sent it to my publisher uh, in New York, um, he wrote back to me and said, um, we can't publish that. 
Um, and I said, why not? And he said, well, look at it. Uh, the We don't have the technology to bind a book of that size uh, economically. Um, so there were two choices. One is to just have this huge, thick book um, with very tiny print and very thin paper, which would not, which which would be very expensive to produce and would not give readers a good experience. Um, or the alternative is I have to divide it into two volumes. Um, so I went with the second decision uh, because there was, I, I thought that was the better choice. Um, and so I did, in fact, that he says you say divide the book right down the middle. Um, now this actually worked out okay. Um, because if you look at my previous books in the series, they were all written with the idea of a turn right in the middle anyway. So the Grace of Kings turned right in the middle. So right after the fall of the old Zana Empire, a new story starts, and that was right down the middle. Um, in The Wall of Storms, similarly, the coming of the Lyuku happens right in the middle of the book. So again, it's divided into two halves. Um, and it turns out that the Veil Throne and Speaking Bones very naturally had a dividing point in the right in the middle where the story takes a turn. So it felt very natural to divide the book right there. And so instead of having one big book, it would just be two um, still big books. Um, and, and that was the decision. Um, now, my thinking is, um, I do really want readers to read The Veiled Throne and Speaking Bones together as a single volume because it's really one arc. Um, and my feeling was that um, on publication, it might annoy readers a little bit because you would have to wait some period of time before you could actually finish the story. But in the long term, I felt this was the better thing to do uh, because once all the books are out, readers can choose to read the whole thing, the, the third and fourth books together as one book. Um, so even though it looks like a quartet, um, I still think that structurally it feels like a trilogy. It really is three separate stories combined into one. Um, it's just the last story had to be divided down the middle. Eh, como ha comentado Ernest, eh, tus primeras publicaciones, que también estaban disponibles en español, fueron relatos cortos, pero de repente mmm, nos encontramos con una saga épica de miles de páginas. Eh, obviamente tiene que ser distinto escribir un relato corto que escribir una novela tan larga. ¿Cómo afrontaste la escritura de un proyecto tan inmenso, tan alargado en el, en el tiempo y también tan diferente de lo que estaba acostumbrado a hacer antes. Well, you know, I um I sometimes joke with people that I know how to write very short things and I know how to write very long things, but I don't seem to know how to write a normal novel. Um and that's still kind of true. I don't really know how to write a normal novel. I've written very long things and very short things. Um I'll say this, um Writing the series was very difficult for me um, psychologically because when you're writing a short story, you can uh, keep the entire thing in your head um, and you can see the entire shape of it. Uh, but with a series like this, it just was too big for me to um, even comprehend the entirety of the structure I was building. Um, I sometimes felt like one of those workers on the Great Pyramid or the Sphinx or something like that where... All I could see was the little piece I was chiseling, but the shape of the entire thing was beyond my grasp. Um, you have to understand, you know, with um, especially the last book, just revising it, going from beginning to end to revise it, took more than a year to just do one pass. Uh, and I had to do multiple rounds of edits on it. So it really did sometimes feel like I was lost at sea and I didn't know what the shape of the whole thing was because you know as i was revising i would realize there are certain things i need to change and i had to take notes for myself and so which every with every revision pass by the time i got to the end more than a year had passed and the notes i had written to myself earlier now seemed like messages from another person and I had to go back and do it again um and for those of you who you know remember this 
I wrote this last book during、um, some of the most difficult times in、uh, in modern times during the middle of the pandemic and and so on. So there was a lot of、um, a lot of difficulty that I had to go through、um, as I was trying to get this book ready for publication.、Um, I had to learn to keep myself going、um, and to remember、um, what. Drove me to write the story in the first place. I had to really remember that and 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 dig deep.、Um, so I I feel like I learned a lot about myself writing this very long story and and trying to understand what drove me to write it, what made me excited about storytelling in the first place,、um, and to to observe myself change because it's it's really a very interesting phenomenon, right?、Um, most of us, when we write a short story, we feel like we remain. The same person at the beginning and the end. We we tell the whole story, but ten years passed between me writing the very first words of the Grace of Kings and the very last words of Speaking Bones.、Um, and、um, and here's the thing: I actually knew what the last scene would be when I wrote the Grace of Kings. Like I knew what that final scene would be like when I wrote the Grace of Kings. It just took me a long time to get there. But by the end of it, I was a very different person than who I was at the beginning of it, and that's a very unique experience. You start out,、um, you know, as this person with no children, and then by the end of it, your daughters are now, you know, ten and、um, uh, and 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 seven, and you're sort of like, wow,、um, I'm a very different person now. And you look back at the book that you wrote at the very beginning and the end. Um, it's it's a huge change.、Uh, it's it's just massive,、uh, and I felt like I changed a lot. En en tu narrativa corta y en la serie la de la dieta del diente del león no solo cambia el el formato y las dimensiones y el esfuerzo de de redacción y documentación que te supone, sino también、eh, son mundos distintos. Eh, Eh, y eh, géneros eh, distintos en la dinastía en, a, a lo largo de estos diez años eh, eh, cam... ¿Te, te sigues sintiendo cómodo con la definición、eh, que creaste para para esta línea narrativa de largo aliento que era el, el silk punk te sigues sintiendo cómodo en esa definición un poco cansado y en cuanto a la definición del del silk punk el silk lo lo entiendo bastante el sentido la parte punk de silk punk qué qué sentido tiene más allá de la del paralelismo con el steam punk victoriano por supuesto oh yeah that's a great question Ernst I'm I'm really glad you asked it because、um, people hear the term silk punk which is a term I invented to describe the books Uh, and I, it turns out that most of the time people don't really understand what it means.、Um, they think it means like you know a parallel with steampunk.、Um, it's actually not.、Um, so, in my conception,、uh, the punk part is much more important than the silk part. Actually, uh, uh, so punk to me, you know, is a word that has been really bleached of its meaning. But I'm I'm trying to restore power to it.、Uh, punk is a aesthetic. Um, uh, movement is about doing things and saying things、uh, that are not accepted.、Uh, it's about using things in places where they're not expected, and it's about trying to repurpose and reappropriate things for new purposes.、Uh, which is, you know, to me, the very heart of what a silk punk novel is about. So,、uh, to briefly.、Um, Recap what I'm trying to do here.、Um, the Dandelion Dynasty is、um, a series about modernity. It's about what it means to be modern and what it means to have the emergence of modernity. The way we talk about it here in the West normally is the story of the Renaissance, really. So, in some sense,、um, I make a joke about this, but it's not entirely a joke.、Um, I say that you know. The United States, which is often seen by a lot of people around the world as the、um, modern nation par excellence,、um, it is a, a modern nation、uh, that is, in some ways, cosplaying Greco-Roman punk. 
Okay, what I mean is this: um, a lot of the words we speak about for modernity in 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 the West are not vernacular words. They're now words derived from our original languages, especially if you're an English speaker. Um, words like chemistry, physics, democracy, um, republic. Um, these are not Anglo-Saxon words. They are Latin and Greek words repurposed to say something new. Now, we view ourselves as somehow connected to that Greco-Roman past. So if you go to Washington, D.C., you see that the temples are um, the temples. The um, the buildings, such as uh, the Supreme Court, look like Roman temples. Uh, we actually have something called the Capitol, and we actually have senators. And if you know American history, we the Federalists actually wrote under Roman names. Um, this is all very strange, really. Why is it that a modern nation must cosplay as Greco-Roman punk? Well, it turns out that the modernity that we think of as modernity is Greco-Roman punk. It is about taking classical Greco-Roman concepts and repurposing them for something entirely new. It's using those old words to say something that hadn't been said. Modernity is actually constructed from bits of the Greco-Roman past. So what I wanted to do in Soap Punk is to say, can we imagine an alternative to that modernity? Is it possible to reconstitute, reconstruct, and recombine and rebuild modernity using a different set of past, uh, bits of the past? Um, so what if we could take East Asian history and mythology and reconceive a modernity built on those pieces? So that now we're talking about constitutionalism, we're talking about modernity, we're talking about science, we're talking about knowledge seeking, we're talking about the very idea of a new political consciousness that we would recognize as modern. But what if they were built using a East Asian inspired kind of uh, original um, uh, origin story instead of a Greco-Roman one? What would that look like? That's really what the Dungeon Dynasty was about, and that's why I call it Silk Punk. Now, the reason is, um, especially here in the U.S., a lot of times when we speak about East Asia, the um, idea is to fossilize it, to treat East Asia as somehow outside of modernity, meaning that East Asian philosophies are different from modern philosophies, that East Asian ideas are somehow old and in the past and not relevant for the modern world, um, and that East Asian conceptions of modernity has to be entirely colonized and reviewed in terms of, of what we would think of as Western ideas. And simultaneously, when we speak about modernity here in the United States, we often exclusively think about roots from the Greco-Roman past. We don't think about contributions from the indigenous people of the United States or contributions from the Chinese immigrants or contributions from the African Americans. Um, and I wanted to change that. I wanna, I wanna reimagine and speak about modernity in a new way. Um, and so that's what Silk Punk was really about. It's a new way of conceptualizing what East Asian elements are. And, can be as part of modernity. And it's a way of reimagining what modernity looks like. Um, it doesn't have to be just Greco-Roman punk. There are other ways to think about modernity. Um, so that's what soap punk is about. Um, and so it's not really about um, the silk punk, the, the, the steampunk parallel, uh, which I think is helpful for people to just get a very visceral understanding of what it's about. Um, but I think for me, the punk part is far more important. It's about challenging ideas about what modernity can be uh, and how we can we can think about it, um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. en, 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 en aquel ya en, entrevista que pudimos hacer por correo electrónico, en determinado momento me dijiste que en parte trabajabas dentro de la tradición de Tolkien y en parte trabajabas en contra de la tradición de Tolkien en el, en el doble sentido en, en, en ambos sentidos este trabajar contra la tradición de Tolkien incluye todo esto que me estás eh, diciendo no y yo creo que además que en esto no no estás solo digamos creo que estamos en una especie de, de proceso de descolonización del 
género de la fantasía en el que se están haciendo aportaciones desde mm. muchos sitios. Hace poco leí a uh, Jelly Clark y su serie sobre eh, que se desarrolla en un Egipto alternativo también. Eh, eh, o sea, es un esfuerzo en el que no está solo, es una tendencia general, ¿no? I, I think that's very much right. Um, you know, Rebecca Ronhors uh, is another one who has done some amazing work in that same vein. Uh, so has uh, Tochi Anibuchi and um, uh, Kate Elliott actually has done, done some really amazing work in that vein as well. Um, I think that's just part of, you know, the post-colonial modernity that we are living in. Um, we're now trying to reimagine modernity as not just cosplaying one particular vision of the past, but um, how can we envision a modernity that is truly reflective of the diversity of traditions that all go into it? And how can we make modernity feel at home for everyone rather than a translated experience for some people. Um, and that's something that struck me a lot as I was traveling around the world. The number of people who told me that in some sense, modernity felt translated to them in that they don't feel a direct connection between their vernacular um, and the modernity, which is English dominated uh, to them. Um, and uh, the sense that somehow, you know, the the stories and the knowledge that were meaningful to them and their ancestors were excluded from modernity, meaning they're not relevant to the modern world. That to be modern is in some sense to reject that part of themselves and to learn a new set of stories um, that are rooted um, in a different tradition than the one that, that they felt at home in. And I, I think that was true for a lot of people. Um, and. I thought, okay, well, you know, this is not, certainly I'm not alone um, in, in, in noticing this. What are some things we can do in the modern world to reestablish that connection between the past and the future, to make all of our pasts relevant for the future and not just one past? Um, so uh, I'll say a little more about this with and against the Tokyo tradition. Um, Tolkien is, again, somebody who uh, did this wonderful thing of connecting the past with the future. He did a huge amount of work to rediscover a part of the Western tradition that had been forgotten, which is the Germanic connection. Uh, and 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 you know, as a as a as a lover of Anglo-Saxon literature, and same as me, um, what Tolkien did was so wonderful because he wanted to revitalize and to rejuvenate that huge tradition that had been excluded. Um, from um, uh, English literature as a result of the Norman conquest um, and, and a lot of the, um, uh, the Renaissance um, that, that ended up excluding that part of our past. Um, and he brought that Germanic tradition to the forefront and made it rooted um, in his fantasy story and gave everyone this vision of, of how that past can be inspiring and be an epic story Uh, of the Anglo-Saxon sense of 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 um, of the world, uh, and what's so wonderful about it is he wrote it with a very specific tradition in mind, and yet his story ended up being absolutely universal because everyone can find themselves in it, and everyone can see themselves at home in it. Now, uh, I'm not gonna you know sugarcoat the fact that there is a lot of racial Uh, latent racial um, um, uh, prejudice embodied in the work as well that you can see. Um, Tokian was, you know, someone who was limited by his historical circumstances. And so um, the fact that the evil races in the books are seem to have Asiatic features and so on is not something that, you know, I'm going to ignore. Um, it's true, you know, that that's that's also part of his imagination. But it doesn't prevent me from admiring the greatness of his vision and the grandness of his work. Um, so I want to continue in that tradition. You know, everybody who writes epic fantasy now has to acknowledge the fact that we are writing the shadow of Tokian. He was somebody who truly invented the genre in some sense. Um, before him, epics were epics. After him, epics now could be seen as part of modern fantasy, uh, which is wonderful. 
Um, and so when I wrote The Grace of Kings and other authors uh, who, who do similar things as I do, we are acknowledging our debt to Tolkien, but we're also trying to go against him a little bit in the sense that we want to say that, you know, it's not just one tradition that um, implies um, uh, a tradition that's connected with, say, European colonialism or the European perspective or a particular strain of European thought has to be the only way for fantasy to be universal, to be uh, to speak to everyone. It is possible to write stories that are inspired by other traditions um, that similarly take those traditions and make them into wonderful modern um, houses for everyone to find home in. Now, I do want to say that Tolkien was in some ways very conscious of about not writing uh, about modernity. He really was in some ways trying to make the medieval point of view um, relevant and understandable for a modern audience. Uh, his project was different from mine in that I explicitly embrace modernity and want to write a story about the modern world, and he was not. Um, but other than that distinction, which is important, um, I do think that our projects are also very similar in a lot of ways. Um, also, uh, because of Tolkien's success, there's this prejudice or this sort of idea that fantasy has to always be about um, a yearning for some sort of perfect past, you know, re the return of the good king uh, and sort of this anti-democratic, anti-republican, anti-modern uh, stance. Um, and I don't think that's true. I mean, Tolkien himself was not really, I, I don't think it's fair to read Tolkien as um, being against modernity. Uh, but, but nonetheless, it is true that his books were trying to espouse a medieval kind of uh, ethos. Um, I and many other authors writing in the contemporary landscape are explicitly trying to write fantasy that acknowledges and embraces modernity, um, especially the, the modern uh, point of view, um, which is often um, deeply distrusting of authority and 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 uh, takes a very open-minded stance towards tradition. Tradition is important to us, but it is not everything. Um, eh, Ken, en, este, en el libro está muy presente la narración oral como vehículo para transmitir el conocimiento a través del tiempo, pero visto desde dos perspectivas distintas, porque por un lado tenemos los habitantes de Dara y por el otro lado tenemos los de Ukyu Gonde. ¿Tienes algún referente específico en el que te inspirara para escribir estas dos vertientes opuestas sobre la tradición oral? Um, so the the book that was probably most influential on me in this regard is um, a book called Orality and Literacy uh, by Walter Ong, O-N-G is the last name. Um, the, the book was really about the idea of orality versus literacy. Um, and it's, uh, it's one of the most fundamental revolutions in human history uh, when we adopted literacy. Uh, and 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 view the written word as the definitive vehicle for passing on wisdom to the next generation. Um, I sometimes make a joke that the Dan Van Dynas long version of a short story I wrote called "The Book Making Habits of Select Species," um, which is not a hundred percent a joke because there's some truth to it. Um, the book "Making Habits of Select Species" is a story about how different um, species can use, um, can embody very different ways of um, writing down their wisdom, whatever writing means, and passing it on. Because it turns out that writing is, uh, to me, a very interesting concept. How do you how do you turn thought into some sort of concrete embodiment? Um, how what does that mean even? Uh, I sometimes talk about technology itself as a form of writing because technology is also a way for us to make our thoughts tangible and uh, to pass on to the next generation. 
construction is a form of 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 writing um landscaping is a form of writing uh, almost anything that makes our thoughts tangible in the universe is a form of writing uh and my story was an exploration of what that means um the dungeon dynasty beyond all the other things i've talked about is also very much a story about uh forms of writing and what what that means um the the people of dara and the luku are very different they are two uh very different cultures in terms of their attitude towards uh writing um dara is a lot like us uh, in the sense that we're all um in the modern world anyway we're all um speakers of grapholects meaning languages that prioritize and centralize the, the place of writing. Writing is the thing that unifies different versions of a language. So whether it's English or Spanish or Mandarin or Arabic, these are all graphics. They're all languages that are united by writing and pay homage to writing and honor writing as a core form of expression. Um, but that's not the only way. The Luku are a deeply anti-literate people. They are an oral people. Um, and, and part of my attempt here is to explore the idea of orality as an alternative to literacy and why literacy is not always better than orality. Now, what we're seeing in the, in the present moment is what I call the emergence of orality 2.0. Because when you observe young people, with TikTok, with YouTube Shorts, with Snapchat, with even the way they text each other, writing is much more subsidiary to speech. Um, therefore, even the forms of writing that they engage in, that they admire, are very much um, governed by oral uh, principles. So, you know, after thousands of years where writing is the primary form of culture generation. We are back in an age where orality is more important, aided by technology. It used to be that if you wish to speak to someone far away from you, you have no choice but to write. Um, even, you know, the Akkadians of Mesopotamia knew that, which is why we have some of the earliest cuneiform tablets, which are customer complaints, right? You know, we, we all know that the the world's oldest uh, customer complaint is actually um, some of these clay tablets that have survived, complaining about merchants being dishonest and, and not giving the buyer good copper. Um, but thousands of years later, we're now living in an age where technology allowed us, allows us to do that orally. You can now make a video. <laughs> Um, a little viral video that will go around the world. And you don't have to write, you, you speak, you you embody and express yourself in this, in this style that's simultaneously ephemeral and also permanent. Uh, it's amazing. This is not something that the ancients like Plato ever imagined. You know, Plato is trying to argue about the distinction between orality and literacy and why the written word is not a true repository of wisdom because you have to interrogate and you have to be able to debate. It's in that active engagement that you have knowledge. Um, the Lyuku would very much agree with that. You know, you could say that the Lyuku are actually Platonists at heart. They 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 are deep believers in orality. Um, I, I wonder what they would make of this world we live in, um, where, you know, you have TikToks, which give the illusion of orality, but you can't interrogate with them either. Or maybe can you? You can you can make you know comments and, and whatnot. So I don't really know. I, I I think it's just a wonderful moment we're living through where we're challenging all of these assumptions we had about orality versus literacy. Um and, and we're living through this age of orality 2.0, which just amazes me. Um and I, I find it really uh, fantastic. Um and a lot of the things we're going through now inspired. Uh, some of the moments in the Dandelion dynasty. Um, so readers have commented on how the novels remind them of this debate over post-truth worlds and, and the idea about what does it mean to even have facts anymore? Um, and that's conscious. Um, you know, I was writing a fantasy, but I was also very much living the real world. And I realized that these 
crises we're going through in epistemology, in, in truth finding, in fact defining, are very much uh, the same kind of problems that the people of Dara and Ukuyugande were going through. Um, and my fantasy is not just a fantasy. It is, in some ways, um, a way for me to work through um, these complicated issues that I was dealing with in the real world. Eh, digamos que los ukios hoy enviarían mensajes eh, de voz por WhatsApp y los de Dara los odiarían, y en este caso sería de los de Dara, definitivamente. Eh... Sí, eh, es una cuestión generacional, supongo. Eh, Leticia, antes hemos intercambiado mensajes sobre los temas que, que, que queríamos tocar cada uno y ella está especialmente interesada en hablar de tu faceta como, como traductor. Quizás sería ahora el momento, ya que tenemos todos estos temas lingüísticos sobre, sobre la mesa de hablar de ello, Leticia. Perfecto. Eh... ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo afrontas tu labor de volcar otros textos al inglés? Porque eh, aparte de, de hacer la labor de traducción, sé que cuando, por ejemplo, tradují, tradují, traduciste a, a Cixin Liu, variaste algunas de las interpretaciones para que fueran más, no sé si comprensible para el lector, para el lector occidental. Y también has tenido en otras ocasiones que ejercer como editor, aparte de, traduzo, de traductor, cuando hiciste las dos recopilaciones de relatos chinos que se publicaron, que se han publicado también en, en España. Entonces, ¿cómo afrontas la labor de trasladar? un contenido que está escrito en un idioma que funciona de una manera determinada para un público determinado y lo tienes que volcar a otro idioma que no funciona de la misma manera y a un público diferente. Um, so, that's a great question, Leticia, and uh, I almost wish that uh, we should ask my translator um, in, in Spanish to, uh, to answer this. I, I, I almost think, like, Um, that would be a much more interesting answer than the one I'm going to give. Um, but I will say this. Um, I find it somewhat frustrating uh, when people always say things like uh, can change things for um, an audience. Um, that to me is like a tautology. Well, the book was written in one language and I wrote it in another. So, of course, it's changed. The, the, the issue behind that is there's some sort of assumption that there is a correct translation and then somehow I was deviating from that and therefore I was doing a bad thing. Um, now, those of you who are actually uh, multilingual know that uh, this is nonsense. Uh, there is no such thing as, as the correct translation. There are many incorrect translations, but there is no such thing as a single correct translation. Uh, it always depends on what it is you're trying to do. Uh, to give you a very simple example, right? So um, let's say that Plato is, is who we're talking about, right? So you translate Plato from classical Greek into modern English, let's say. And Plato has a line that says, um, man is a rational animal. Okay, so how do you translate man? Uh, do you think if Plato were alive today, he would say, man, meaning only male humans or humans who identify as men are rational. Maybe, maybe not, actually. If you really think about it, I'm not convinced that if Plato were talking today, he would necessarily agree with you that what he meant was only male humans or humans who I self-identify as male, in, as men in gender. Um, so wouldn't it be more correct to translate this as humans? Now, if you do that, there will be a group of people who will go up against you and say, you change things. Um, really? Do you think you change things or not? Because what would Plato have actually said if he were alive today? Um, so now I'm in the fortunate circumstance where I don't need to do that. I can ask the author. I'm translated a living author. So I asked the living author, you use this word, which literally by dictionary will be rendered this way in English. Now, I don't think that's what you actually meant. So let's have a discussion about what did you actually mean? Like, you know, when you say this word in this context, a Chinese reader would understand you meant this and this. Um, 
But if you literally render it this way into English, an English reader would not necessarily think you meant all these things. So which do you mean? We have a discussion. And then I say, okay, then in that case, I think the literal word is not the correct word. And this is what I would say instead. Or I would say the way you presented the story is not, if rendered literally, would not, in fact, give people the sense of what you meant. I'm going to ask you what you meant, and I'll do it. Now, because I do this, uh, people will say, well, you didn't use the literal word he used, so you change things. But to me, this is nonsense. Like, if you go with, you know, what was actually written literally um, by dictionary, then you have, in fact, done the author a disservice. You have not actually conveyed what he meant to say. Um, but it's very frustrating to sort of explain to people this because they're always trying to say, you change things. These are the same people who say, you know, if you say Plato said humans, you are changing things because he was, you know, some sort of um, sexist and he must have meant only males. Well, we don't know that. How, how do we know? Like, we have to drag him out and see if he were alive today and he were brought up into today, today's society. What would he say? Um, I'm not convinced that that that's the correct translation. So we can have these debates all we want. But ultimately, you just have to go with what is most respectful of the author's intention. Um, and I am lucky in that I have an author I can ask questions of. So I ask the author, you know, what he meant. Um, and I can then translate um, and rewrite um, in uh, English um, what he actually meant uh, without being bound by the exact words he used, um, which if literally rendered would give the incorrect meaning. Claro, entonces esto nos lleva a preguntar eh, la siguiente pregunta. Eh, en esta ocasión, ¿has tenido relación con tu traductor al español? Eh, ¿Te ha preguntado sobre alguna, eh, algún párrafo en particular o sobre alguna idea eh, de, de este libro para volcarlo al español? Um, so, part of the... Um... Uh, part of my experience of having done some literary translation uh, is to understand how difficult the job really is. And I, I do try to be helpful in that way. Um, I always tell my, um, you know, publishers into various languages that, you know, uh, I'm super, super open to communicating with my translator. I mean, there are some authors who don't find this a thing that they should do. And I don't understand that. How can you not want to talk to your translator? Because you certainly do want what you meant to say to come across, as opposed to just, you know, um, uh, for somebody to interpret your words uh, and without confirming with you, that's really what you meant. Um, so I, I will say that I have had good experiences into um, um, most of the languages that I've, I've been translated into. Um, I really enjoy talking with my um, translators about uh, what they want to do. Um, I think in the case of my translation to Spanish, I have had experiences where my translators would definitely come to me and ask me, you know, um, here's something you said, and I know where it comes from, but you know, in Spanish, this is not going to work, but we can't do it literally. Here's what I propose to do. Do, do, do you see why I'm doing it? I'm like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Or, you know, they'll come to me and say, um, I don't know what you meant by this. This is not a thing that I understand. Like, are you trying to make a neologism? Like, if so, what is the root? Um, what is the reference? I don't get it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. So here's what I'm doing. I'm going to explain it to you. And then you can construct uh, your version of, of, of making that work. Um, I really love that. Um, and, you know, there are tons of stories about how translators don't communicate with their authors and then end up... Uh, spending a lot of effort on something that they really shouldn't be. Um, you know, I've had, I've heard stories of translators trying to track down the name of some species so they can render it correctly, only to find out that the author made it up. And so, you know, days of research was wasted, you know, that's why I definitely encourage translators to communicate with their authors if they can, um, because a lot of times these sort of things can be cleared up very easily. Um, I don't know why that's not more of a norm. Um, I've spoken to some literary translators where they really don't like the idea of communicating with their authors. 
I think it's very strange. Maybe this is connected to the idea of um, of our weird worshiping of the written word. Uh, being a very literate society, we sometimes think that the written word has more authority than the author. It's a very strange twist on the old uh, deconstructionist idea, right? The deconstructionists were always saying that we shouldn't respect the text as though it's the word of God and the author is the equivalent of God and we're supposed to interpret the, int interpret the intentions of the author. But sometimes I think we do the opposite. You know, we sort of say the author is dead. The only thing that lives is the word. Um, so, you know, whatever the author says doesn't matter. If the author says that's what they meant, who cares? This is what he wrote. So we're just going to go with the literal words that were written down. This to me is such a stupid and strange idea. I don't I don't get that. Why do we want to misinterpret authors? You know, Plato said very specifically, don't do that. Don't just take the words on the page and say, oh, I'm going to interpret them to mean what I want them to mean. No, talk to the author. The author is the only thing that matters. Um, so again, you know, whether I'm doing the translation or people are translating me, I want people to talk to me about my intentions. It's not the words on the page that matter. It's the intention. Yo tenía ganas de hacer unas cuantas preguntas sobre los referentes concretos de, desde el punto histórico y legendario de, 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 de distintos momentos de la historia, de la historia de la literatura china sobre los libros, pero me quedé antes con lo del hogar para todos y quizás lo aparco, si no es de tiempo lo preguntaré después, pero eh, quería y ahora ir quizás por otro, por, por, por otro lado. Los temas que son eh, mucho más generales y alejados de cualquier referente cultural concreto. Antes has dicho esta frase que me ha gustado mucho, que querías que eh, la, esta, de que esta literatura fuese un hogar para todos, que todo el mundo se sintiese como... Entonces hay unas cuantas cuestiones que son absolutamente transversales y que van más allá de los referentes culturales. Por ejemplo, en... Eh, el pescador que acaba viviendo en otro mundo quizás hoy sería un contador de, de fake news. Eh, para los UQ no entienden hasta qué punto retuerce y cambia las historias y las falsifica. Eh, hay un personaje que tiene un, una disyuntiva moral eh, muy pesada en este libro, que es el, el colaborar o no colaborar con el invasor. ¿Cómo haces más daño a tu gente colaborando o no colaborando? Esta es también una experiencia totalmente universal y tiene un peso muy fuerte en, en este libro. O la posibilidad de hacer convivir eh, diversas culturas. Aquí pues es el melting pot de Estados Unidos puede funcionar o no puede funcionar. O, o la pasión por las batallas sucesorias en una dinastía. ¿Por qué nos apasiona tanto desde el Rey Lear hasta Succession las, uh, las guerras dinásticas y, y familiares? O sea, hay, hay toda una serie de, de, de temas que yo iba a preguntar por... Uh, por la, el ascenso de la dinastía Han, pero me lo guardo y me prefería preguntar por estos temas más, más generales primero. Por ejemplo, la, la, el, 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 el tema de la, de, de la posibilidad de convivir entre culturas y no culturas y llegar a un sincretismo cultural eh, y perder, no perder la identidad, la, la, la identidad. Este es uno de los temas, claramente, del libro, ¿no? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's one of the primary features of modernity, which is, um, you know, one of the hallmarks of modernity is the movement of peoples and the fact that um, uh, as a result of the movement of peoples, cultures um, that at one point could simply be separated now must learn to live together in some manner. Um, and, and what does that mean? Uh, is Are we doomed to endless conflict or are we doomed to the model of one culture must triumph over all? Um, there are no simple answers to these difficult questions. These are things that everybody in the modern world has to deal with and engage with. Um, uh, I will I will say this. Um, I think a lot of times the models that we have for speaking about cultural exchange and cultural um, uh, contact is very lacking. Uh, we, we seem to have a very poor vocabulary for describing these conditions. Um, we're always thinking about these in the model of conquest or 
uh, absorption in some manner. So that's why we speak about things like assimilation and we speak about uh, preservation. So as though those are the only two choices, you can either just change entirely and disappear or you can just refuse to change at all. But the reality is that's not how humans behave. And that's that's just not how it is. Um, whenever a, a, a culture is opens itself up to migration, by having others come in or whenever a culture moves away, change happens in both directions. That's just the way it is. Um, and that's the only healthy way for it to be. So for example, in the United States, I've often pushed back against this narrative we have uh, in the US, right? We have a very dominant narrative about how immigrants need to be very grateful uh, to be welcomed as part of the United States. and and to be um, allowed to build a home here because this is the land of opportunity. And I often push back against that. And I say, no, that is not correct. Um, immigrants should be grateful, but so should those of us who are already here. We should be grateful to each other. In the same way that immigrants come here to seek opportunity, those who are already here receive opportunity from those who come here. We help each other in the same way that those who come to the U.S. change. We also change because of others who come to the U.S. We change together. Um, assimilation is not a, 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 a one direction movement. Um, it's about all of us changing at the same time. Uh, and change is not bad. Change is what humans have always done since time immemorial. A culture that does not change is a dead culture. Um, preservation is not interesting to me at all. You only preserve things that are already dead. Um, do you really wish your culture to be like a butterfly pinned between the pages of a book? No, we don't, we don't do that. Living things don't need to be preserved. Living things grow and change and expand and, 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 and mutate. Um, and they then the metamorphosis is the only real model for culture. Um, and so in the Denzelan dynasty, um, you'll see that I have a very I take a very strong stance against both the traditional assimilationist um, uh, narrative, which is newcomers must change entirely to become just like the ones who are already there. Nope, I, I disagree with that in, intensely. At the same time, I push very hard against the narrative that cultural preservation means you just don't change, that you stick to your ways exactly the way your ancestors taught them to you. Um, that's also a recipe for disaster. Um, in the Denzelan dynasty, every culture changes. Every single person changes. Everybody changes in response to cultural exchange. Um, and it's, it's the simultaneous change of all for all that I advocate as the only model that makes sense. Um, none of us can stay exactly the same and none of us can avoid change. It's better to embrace change and to try to change in a direction that truly is more expressive of our most cherished values and stories. Y si volvemos un momento al, 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 al tema que te comentaba, que hay eh, referentes que, se, que se pueden acabar encontrando fácilmente dentro de la novela, o sea, la, el conflicto entre Shu y Han, los inmensos barcos de las expediciones imperiales del, del 15 o las invasiones de pueblos nómadas o leyendas como la lucha de la serpiente, incluso en el primer eh, volumen, algunas pueden ser necesarias para eh, entender en su a, adecuadamente el libro y otras supongo que eh, puedes, se te puede escapar cuál es el referente que hay detrás y disfrutar igualmente de, 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 del libro. De cara al lector, le señalarías algún referente histórico legendario concreto que tú quisieras destacar y que recomendases al lector eh, no os perdáis eh, eh, leed o si es necesario ir a Wikipedia y eh, buscar este referente porque eso os ayudará a, a entender el libro que a, a, a dar algún consejo en este en este sentido um... You know, I, I'm not sure um, that's really necessary. Um, uh, the reason for that is is the following. Um, 
it's certainly possible to read Shakespeare or Cervantes, right? If you understand all the references and know exactly what they're talking about. But it is also possible to admire these authors and to love what they do without necessarily understanding everything. It is possible to enjoy, you know, Julius Caesar without knowing the actual histories that um, he drew on. And it is possible to understand and appreciate and laugh at Don Quixote without necessarily understanding all the background um, history and, and the religious issues uh, that form the background. Um, so my view is for readers who are deeply versed in East Asian philosophy and culture and Anglo-Saxon culture and history. So this is something that I, I want to be clear, right? So uh, because I was writing a silk punk novel, one of the things that mattered to me was to be very punkish about it. So I put in a lot of Anglo-Saxon um, uh, references um, in a milieu that seems to be East Asian inspired. And that was on purpose. I wanted to show that there's nothing... Um, you, you don't have to, quote unquote, stay in your lane. You don't have to write uh, 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 some sort of fantasy novel inspired by a culture and just somehow preserve cultural purity, you know, whatever that means. Uh, that that has always been completely irrelevant to me. I wanted to show that just as in the modern world, we're all deeply influenced by multiple traditions, a fantasy world can also be constructed from multiple traditions. So if you are somebody, a reader who is just like me, deeply steeped in Anglo-Saxon literature and East Asian philosophy um, and traditional Greek philosophy, um, and also a great deal of uh, modern, good old fashioned Yankee American entrepreneurship, then yes, you will get all the references because some of the jokes are jokes about American history. Some of the jokes are about uh, Anglo-Saxon poetry, um, and some of the jokes are about what it's like to be a grad student in an American university. Um, if you get all of these references, and, and some of the jokes are even about what it's like to be a lawyer um, in, a, in a multinational law firm, uh, if you get all of the references, your appreciation of the book will be, you know, of a certain level. Um, but if you don't get all of them, and you just um, take from it, what you can take from it based on your own life experiences and your own understanding of human nature, your understanding is no less than 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 the other readers. It's it's just as beautiful and valid and wonderful. Um, that's part of what I want to do. I, you know, I think a book that truly is welcoming to everyone has to be that. Um, you know, it, it has to be welcoming to everyone. Um, based on your own life experience, your understanding of human nature, if you find these characters moving to you and interesting to you, then I will have done my job. Um, you know, when I was a child reading books from cultures that I did not fully understand, I could nonetheless see their beauty and, and understand um, why these stories are compelling because I could see the universal human emotions behind them and the motivations which are constant across cultures. Um, later on, when I was older, you know, I could appreciate a lot of these cultural references more, um, but I don't think my early enjoyment was any less due to my ignorance. Um, so I guess the answer to your question is I don't think there's anything that readers uh, shouldn't miss. Um, I, I, if there's one thing I want them to remember, it's that this is not a series that's only about um, East Asian cultures. Um, it's not. Um, it's 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 a book based on my own experiences. And, you know, I am someone who loved um, the Anglo-Saxon poets. Um, I loved Beowulf. Um, that's a touchstone uh, poem for me. Uh, and so my fantasy is going to include everything that I loved in it. Um, and um, if you don't necessarily share the exact same set of references as me, that's not a problem. Um, I hope you find joy in this book based on your own set of beautiful references.
una otra pregunta, quizás saliéndonos un poco del tema de las referentes, pero volviendo a la integridad del texto, es que la tecnología y su desarrollo tiene un papel muy importante en, en toda la saga. Eh, incluso tiene un capítulo dedicado a la cámara oscura en este mismo, en este mismo tomo. Eh, ¿Crees que la forma de evolucionar eh, de la cultura o de la civilización se basa siempre en la guerra y en el enfrentamiento, que es lo que provoca que se vayan mejorando la tecnología? Um, that's a great question. And um, I think this is one of those cases where there are no real answers because it really depends on what story you want to tell. Um, there are, you know, historians who want to tell the story that war is the only way for us to move forward. And you can certainly construct a history that's centered around that and attribute every invention and every advancement to some war uh, or some effort to prevent war or some effort to win a war. Um, but it's just as valid to tell a very different story in which war plays uh, almost no role and all innovation and all um, progress comes from um, people who are outside of the battlefield and who have nothing to do with it, who are away from the front lines. I think it's really a matter of what is the story you're trying to tell. Um, Ursula K. Le Guin, uh, one of my favorite writers, has an essay called The Carrier Bag Theory of Fiction, which I really admire. Um, and so Spanish readers who don't know this essay, I strongly encourage you to find a copy of it and read it. Um, Ursula K. Le Guin basically says, you know, traditionally, when we talk about culture and civilization, the model is the hunt. It's, it's somebody going out there with a the spear to bring down the mammoth and bring that Um, that that trophy home. Um, and she says, okay, well, if that's the story of culture and civilization, I have no place in it because what I would do is take a bag and go around to gather berries. And um, you're telling me that that story is somehow not uh, relevant. That story is not important. That story is boring. Well, I don't agree with that. I'm going to write stories that are shaped like the carrier bag, the bags you take to gather things. I will not tell a story that's shaped like the spear um, because theorists of fiction uh, will say the only story that matters is the story of the hunt. So everything has to be about conflict, has to be about progress, has to be about how do I bring down the, the mammoth? Uh, and if you listen to certain writing instructors, it does appear that that's all they care about. And they think that's the only story that's worth telling, but it's just not true historically. There have been plenty of stories following the motto of the carrier bag. It's about gathering. It's about talking with your friends. It's about sitting down next to the river uh, after a long hike and just saying, gosh, that was a really wonderful walk, wasn't it? Um, it's about making love next to the river. It's about being lazy. It's about not going around and hunting. Um, those are also very important parts of the human experience. Um, so that's what I would say. I would remind everybody that Being a human is a complicated thing. There are a bazillion things that go into it. Um, and if you think conflict is the only thing that's driven your own story so far, I would say you probably aren't really living your best life or are telling your story right. Um, and, and if you acknowledge that in your own life, uh, conflict is not the only thing that drives you, then why should that be true for civilizations? Bueno, de hecho, la tecnología, que creo que tiene un papel más importante y más, o, o, o se desarrolla de forma más detallada progresivamente y quizás más en este tercer libro, también se utiliza para jugar. Eh, uno, por ejemplo, tenemos estos juguetes, eh, juguetes con hueso, autómatas de huesos neumáticos, digamos, que utilizan lo, los niños. Eh, supongo que de las muchísimas facetas de, de que eh, traductor, escritor, hay también la, su relación con la tecnología, que eh, supongo se ve marcada aquí y, 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 se, y, y ves los dos aspectos, como máquina de guerra y como juguete también. Yo creo que tenemos que ir acabando y... 
Y Leticia quería, quería, quería... Leticia, como tú has dicho, es uno de tus grandes fans, es insaciable. Y aunque en este momento tengamos todos estos libros encima y aún hay el cuarto tomo que nos están esperando, ella quiere más y quería preguntar alguna cosa. No, no, solo queremos saber cómo, qué, qué tiene entre manos ahora mismo. Porque... Eh, después de, de esta saga épica, pues habrás tenido que reflexionar un poco, descansar sobre la escritura y queríamos saber cuáles son tus próximos proyectos. Ah, thank you, thank you to 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 everyone. Um, uh, so quickly on technology, yes, I spend a lot of my career as a technologist, and that's still part of my job now. I'm a futurist, so I consult on projects about futurism, and I talk about Um, uh, narrative futurism and what it means to tell stories about the future and to think about technology and technological advancement. Um, I agree with you, uh, Ernst, on 100% that um, play is incredibly important, not just as a part of technology development, but also as a part of what it means to be human. Uh, one of my most important um, messages, if you will, in the novels Uh, the Dunjuan Dynasty is the importance of play. Um, some of the most innovative things that come out of the books are invented by people at play, and some of the conflicts are resolved by children at play. Um, we don't play enough. Play is a fundamental part of being human, um, is my message, and and we really need to um, elevate it and to 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 treasure it and to make it a core part of modern life again we're so obsessed with being productive that we forget how unnatural this really is you know hunter gatherers as we learn from anthropologists spend about 15 hours a week making a living and the rest of the time is spent at play telling stories making love um educating children walking around catching butterflies um and uh we somehow in the modern world think that um encouraging people to work and to be more productive is somehow uh, a better way of being a human. And this is deeply flawed. Uh, our obsession with being productive uh, is, you know, a, a, a capitalist um, bit of nonsense. It's a mythology that we buy into. Um, but honestly, humans have always and should have always prioritized play above anything else. Um, we should view work as nothing more than um, a, a thing that we have to do to allow us to play and not the other way around. Uh, it's ridiculous that so much of our modern propaganda is focused on making people more productive. Uh, it's, it's really quite offensive, honestly. Um, so my message is everyone should be lazy and play more. Um, that's my message. And read more books. Um, also, uh, Pero Leticia so... hablaba de productividad. Quería saber cómo... Para acabar, ¿cuáles son tus planes? I know, I know, I know. Okay, so let me go back to answering that question. So, um, I honestly, you know, I have the best job in the world because a lot of my job is being just playing. I mean, you know, like, um, you know, I spend a lot of my time uh, while working on the book uh, doing things like this. These are some of the logograms uh, from the books. These are models of the logograms that I made. Um, so, you know, the fact that I could spend a lot of my job doing stuff like that and call it work um, is awesome. <laughs> uh, a lot of my work is just playing. Um, and so to answer your question, um, I do have a few projects right now um, uh, that I'm working on. Uh, some of them... In some of them involve... Um, Can, can you hear me still? Okay, so some of them involve um, uh, uh, film and TV, so I'm not free to talk about it, but others involve uh, short fiction projects I'm working on uh, that are super exciting. Uh, I love being experimental, I love playing. Uh, one of the short stories I just recently wrote with uh, Carolyn Yukum, uh, one of my friends, has been published by Uncanny Magazine. It's called Collaboration, question mark. Uh, and uh, it's uh, it's one of my favorite stories that I've written in the last few years because we were just being very playful with each other. We were challenging each other to tell stories in as outrageous and as strange a way as possible. Um, it was a collaboration, but it was also a game. 
Um, and one of the other things I'm doing now is playing a lot with AI, uh, because I think there's a lot of really interesting potential futures where AI can be a valuable tool um, in the writer's toolkit, in the artist's toolkit. Um, and I, I, I love playing with it to see what can be done with it, what can be made from it. Um, so yeah, I'm certainly keeping myself busy, but I, I wouldn't say any of it is is uh, is painful. I think, um, you know, again, I'm very grateful to everybody, to all my readers and all my publishers and everybody for making this life possible. Um, you know, I get to make up stuff and play for a living. Um, uh, it's it's something that uh, as a child I never dreamed was possible. So I'm very grateful to all of you uh, to be able to do this. Bueno, seguiríamos hablando con Ken todo el rato que pudiéramos, pero la verdad es que tenemos que seguir con nuestra vida, él sobre todo, pobre mío, y no lo podemos secuestrar porque nos pilla un poco lejos. Así que quiero agradecerle eh, profundamente su participación en esta presentación, que ha sido maravilloso, y, y Ernest también muchísimas gracias por, <ríe> por las preguntas y por todo lo que ha, ha, nos ha proporcionado, y nada... Eh, solo me queda recomendaros que leáis cualquier cosa que escriba Ken, tanto relatos cortos como esta maravillosa saga épica de la que pronto conoceremos el final definitivo. Muchas gracias a todos y nada, a comprar libros y a leerlos. Hasta luego. Muchas gracias y espero que nos podamos ver en España en algún momento. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, this has been such a pleasure. Um, Um, I'm really, really glad we got to do this. Thank you.